Welcome back to our series on electricity and magnetism. In this episode, we're going to talk about potential and potential energy. Electric potential is arguably the worst named phenomena in all of physics. And the reason why is we already have a term called potential energy. And because of it, the word potential is naturally confused with it. And yet potential and potential energy are two different things. Let's begin with the one we understand the most, which is potential energy. What we want to look at today is electrical potential energy, U sub E. And it's very similar to gravitational potential energy or spring potential energy. It's always the manifestation of a force. In this case, it's the manifestation of the electrical force. And in order to calculate potential energy, it's like calculating any energy. We take the integral of the force we're interested in, in this case, the Coulomb force, and we dot it with the displacement. That is where we're going to move the object that's subject to this force. In this case, it means moving a charged particle through an electric field. And what we do is we measure the force at each location and we integrate the change of force over that distance using the dot product because it's only displacement in the direction of the force that actually matters. If we move perpendicular to the force, we should get no change of potential energy. Well, this is a fairly simple integral to perform. Unfortunately, though, it's connected to the Coulomb force. And in this course, we almost abandon the force right off the bat. We use the force for a definition, and then we almost immediately convert it to electric field. And we've been measuring electric fields for a long time. It would be really nice if we had a manifestation of potential energy that was in terms of field. But of course, that's relatively easy. Because the calculation of electric field was very similar to the calculation of the Coulomb force, the only difference was the field was a disturbance in space, and so the second particle that actually generated the force between two particles was left out of the field. In essence, the Coulomb force is the same as the second charge times the electric field. And so we can replace the Coulomb force in this integral with QE. And that means we can just as easily calculate electric potential energy by taking negative the integral of QE dot dS. And of course, because this charge, the second charge, is in fact a scalar quantity that doesn't vary either by field or displacement, it can exit the integral. We can actually divide the potential energy by that additional charge. So let's do that. That means this is equal to the potential energy, uh, U sub E, divided by the second charge, Q. And this is such an important quantity to us that we're going to give it a separate name. The variable for it is V, and we're going to call that the potential. So there it is. There's the electrical potential. It's the electrical potential energy yet we're dividing out by the second charge. And here's an analogy that might help you. In the same way that the force existed between two particles, but the electric field was a disturbance in space, the electrical potential energy exists between two charged particles, and the electric potential is a property of space around one. So you can kind of view the relationship between electrical potential energy and potential to be the same as the relationship that exists between Coulomb force and field. In essence, the potential is the field of the energy. However, there's a fundamental difference between these quantities and these quantities, and I think you can see it from the symbols that I've been using. Because the electrical potential energy is the result of an integral, and I haven't put any direction on here, it's just the result of an integrated dot product, Electrical potential energy is a scalar quantity. It is evaluated as magnitude only. It has no direction. We can have positive changes in potential energy and negative, but that's all a function of whether the dot product returns a negative or a positive. It has nothing to do with direction. And because the potential listed as this variable V is just a function of the potential energy divided by Q, another scalar, the potential is also a scalar quantity. 
it is possible to have positive and negative changes in potential, but those positive and negative changes do not in any way represent vector quantities that have direction. So let's summarize these formulas. Again, because these integrals often involve an initial state and a final state, we can rewrite it as delta e u, which is usually the final energy minus the initial energy, and that's equal to negative the integral of f e dotted with d s. And of course, that's also equal to negative the integral of q e dotted with d s. And finally, if I want, I can express the voltage delta v as equal to delta u e over q. And then that's going to equal to the voltage final minus the voltage initial. And that then is going to be equal to negative the integral of e dot ds. The q is eliminated because I've basically divided out by it. Now, a good analogy I can give you about what literally this potential measures is it's very much like altitude in measuring gravitational potential energy. We know that gravitational potential energy measures the energy changes in joules. And of course, this potential energy will measure in joules as well. Voltage, however, is joules per coulomb. And those are the units of potential. V, unfortunately, as a variable, also uses V as a unit. It's a volt, and a volt is equal to one joule per one coulomb. So a joule per coulomb is a volt, and that will be the standard unit of potential. And if your question is, is this like the voltage we see in circuits? The answer is yes. Potential is potential, and we'll see it arise in many instances. It's just we first introduce it in the idea of electrostatics. Okay, well, let's talk about the implications of this dot product, because this is really where we get a great visual clue as to what potential really is. If we consider a nice uniform electric field, like some of the ones we've been looking at recently, where we were using these as analogies for the movement of charge in an electric field, Again, this would be the electric field produced by a large flat plate of charge. But notice, there's no charge indicated here. We don't know where this field comes from, but we are interested in the voltage within this field. Well, <clears throat> notice that because of the displacement dotting with the electric field, only movement in the direction of or anti to the field will produce two different voltages. So if I were to start at this position and move to this position, then I would certainly get a different voltage at each position. I would get V1 here and V2 here. And of course, the voltage change would depend on only one thing, and that is the angle between the displacement vector and the electric field, and that would be this angle right here. Because this is a dot product, its magnitude is provided by E times x, the change in distance, times the cosine of the angle between them. But what happens if we go to the very extreme of that cosine? Suppose instead we moved from this position, v3, to this position, v4. You'll notice that this displacement crosses the field lines perpendicularly. That means the displacement dotted with the electric field will produce zero. Now that doesn't mean both V3 and V3 are zero. That means V3 and, and V4 are the same. And that's very different from V1 and V2. If we move through an electric field, some distance parallel to the field lines will always increase or decrease the potential. But if we move across the field lines, we're moving along what's called an equipotential surface. And this isn't the only one. Every single line that crosses these field lines perpendicularly would represent a new voltage, but everywhere on that line would be a constant voltage because everywhere on that line represents a displacement that is perpendicular to the field. Now, in this case, we have perpendicular lines to a set of horizontal lines because that was the nature of this field. But if instead I had a regular old point charge Q, we know the field lines would radiate outward. This would be the shape of the electric field. 
and therefore the equipotential surfaces would be spherical surfaces, very similar to our Gaussian surfaces, and these would be equipotential. Everywhere along these surfaces would be a single voltage, V1, V2, and on and on, because movement along these surfaces would represent a zero dot product between the displacement and the field, and so everywhere on these surfaces would be the same voltage. In essence, to change in potential or to change in potential energy, you have to move upfield or downfield. If you cross the field, you'll experience no change in energy and no change in voltage. Now, this brings up another interesting point, and that is for a point charge, what would be the voltage at each of these locations? Well, you can certainly go back and perform these integrals in order to satisfy that. After all, we spent quite a long time evaluating the electric fields for lots of different distributions. And as long as you can visualize your ds within that field and you have limits for the integral, you can easily calculate these. But there'll be certain charge distributions that are really common. They'll come up over and over and over again. And we will want to know the potential energy changes and the potential changes within those fields very quickly and easily. Consequently, we'll spend the next couple of episodes learning about the potential and potential energy change in some very common fields.